bulletin, there will be a very brief trustees meeting after the service in the chapel. Uh, Mike tells me that it will not last very long. We just got to take up one quick matter. And then there's also going to be a regular trustees meeting will be this coming Saturday morning at, uh, at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, there will be an administrative board meeting this Tuesday night, 7 o'clock here. All of those who are on the administrative board, we ask that you um, please be in attendance of that. Uh, there's going to be a birthday party for Shirley Cloyce uh, this Saturday uh, afternoon uh, from 2 until 4. That's going to be in the Family Life Center. Uh, we would encourage you to come and uh, uh, celebrate with, uh, with Shirley and Nick and, and, uh, and the family. We have a, an upcoming um, fish fry. It's not going to be this Friday, but it's going to be next Friday. So be, uh, be watching out for that. We're going to need some help with that. Uh, we had a great crowd last time this was held. And, and uh, the more, the more uh, volunteers we have on that, uh, the easier it is for everybody. Tanya? Bake sale will be with that. So do you need help with that? We'll need some help with that. Um, if anyone would like to volunteer to bake for that, uh, that would uh, that would be much much appreciated. Uh, we've got some great cooks in this church. You know what? This, the church just keeps filling up today, and that's wonderful. If people keep coming in, and we've got we've got visitors with us today, and it's it's really good. It's uh, it's it's pleasant to have uh, have you all with us today. Anybody else got a, 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 Sean's going to have a couple announcements, but does anybody else have anything that's coming up that we need to apprise the congregation about? Okay, Pastor? All righty. Um, just wanted to let you know, there is in the, in the newsletter, and I think in the bulletin, an announcement about an SPRC meeting. The SPRC chair has told me that we can just cross that off, that we don't need, need that at this point, so you might want to do that for your records at the house. Uh, don't forget that on the table back in the back, there is a Lenten Bible verse uh, sheet that has uh, basically some, uh, a few scriptures, one for each week that we're trying to memorize and then the, the context that it comes out of out of scripture. So there's simple passages that you can get. They're all one another scriptures about uh, who we're supposed to be as a community and how we do that well. And so I hope that you'll uh, take advantage of that and perhaps even think about joining me in the, the fasting component of that, which is either for the full time between uh, when you finish Tuesday evening meal until Wednesday evening meal comes, or pick a meal in between there, somewhere in that time, and, and do it. But Lent has traditionally been a season where we think about fasting and about giving up some things to, to take on things that are more kingdom-minded, more spiritually-minded, some extra prayer or scripture or help your neighbor out with a project or something like that. So uh, feel free to do that. It would be great to have you involved. Um, also, this Thursday, we're actually starting up with the, the new member or catechism class, and I don't even really know what to call that, because in a way, it, it's a catechism, it's the basic teachings of the, of the church, uh, and it's for new members, but it's also, I'm finding there's a lot of people that have been members and been here a long time, but never went through a confirmation class, never had a membership class or any of that, and so they're interested in what is it that makes Wesleyans Wesleyans? I mean, why are we a Methodist church what is that basic core of beliefs and so if you're interested in that this one will start this thursday at 11 o'clock and i realize anybody working is automatically already out of that so if you can't make that time but you're interested let me know so that we'll if we get enough people we'll set up another one uh, as well but that will be if you can make it that will be in the conference room off the flc at 11 o'clock on thursday we'll start that and it'll run a few weeks depends on how long it takes us to get through the material Probably, it will, at least three, probably no more than five, so we'll, but love to have you involved in that as well. Mr. Saylor, did you have an announcement this morning? I just had a couple of words that I'd like to say that. I appreciate everybody that took care of me last Sunday. Turns out I had a bout of dehydration. I didn't realize it. 
came close to passing out, but did not. But fortunate that we have a couple of nurses in the congregation that knew how to take care of me and knew that I needed to go to the hospital and called the ambulance and got me to King's Daughters and they treated me. But it, it makes me appreciate the church even that much more. So fortunate that, that Lorna and I decided to come here. I want to let you know that I do appreciate everything that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go with our opening scripture. It comes from uh, Psalm one, verses one through six. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, it's time to sing. And you're going to love this one. Oh, love that will not let me go. It's in 374 in the gray hymnal. Let's stand and sing. Mike's going to do that.
Yeah, I gotta say something before we start here. Spencer, you look great, man. You just totally different. I got stand up. I mean, look at this look, man. <laughs> wow. Becky, so great to see you. Power prayer is awesome. All right, I'm going to read the uh, Lenten banner uh, reading number two, the dove. Why would we use the dove as a symbol for Lent? What significance does the dove lend to the Easter story? The quiet, gentle coo of a dove seems to calm and transform a troubled sitting with peace, tranquility, and calm as we listen to a call. Like the dove, which brought back to Noah a branch with leaves to the ark after the flood signaled a new beginning, the dove also send, signaled a new beginning to Jesus' ministry here on earth. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah, Christ, the one upon whom God's Spirit would rest. John the Baptist knew this prophecy and now testified concerning him, saying, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I now baptize you with water, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie. Jesus came to John the Baptist by him in the Jordan River. And John 29 through 34 says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven like a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain. He is who will baptize the world with Holy Spirit and fire. I have seen and now testify that this Jesus is the Son of God. The dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit who descends upon Jesus as his baptism and then sent him forth into ministry. This same Spirit descends upon us when we accept Jesus as our Savior and then compels us to begin our ministry for him. Our lives are transformed, and we begin to testify that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Without the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us, we are powerless. We cannot do ministry on our own. It is only through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as Isaiah stated, that we are filled with wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, peace, power, and the fear of the Lord, and then we are transformed to become witnesses to the gospel. Please accept today the indwelling of the dove, God's Holy Spirit, who will give you peace and transform your life into ministry for him. Thank you, Mike. It's time now for, it's always time for praises, but it happens to be the part in our service when we do that. Um, it's good to have Mickey with us and Diane with us. I praise the Lord for that. We've, we've been praying for these folks for a long time, and it's good, it's good to have you back. And, and uh, Tom mentioned it um, earlier, but uh, it's praise that Tom's here and Tom's well. Um, they're going to get to the bottom of that, I'm sure. Um, anybody else? Anybody got any praises? Michael Carter. 107 in the house tonight, today. That's good. Good crowd. Anybody else? Anybody? Got a praise? Yes, ma'am. Miss Jenny. Great. Praise the Lord, yeah, it's great. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. For those that, for those that are not here, Cindy Cross had a, a, a great uh, cancer uh, appointment, and she's cancer-free, and her, her nephew has accepted the Lord as his Savior. Anybody else? No one? Okay. Well, it's time for offering. Uh, if we can have some ushers. Um, and uh, is a reminder that we have uh, a, a terminal in the lobby. As you all come forward, come on. Um, you guys can come on up. The, uh, we have a terminal in the, in the lobby downstairs at the portico. Uh, if you want to, have a, a, want to use your debit card or credit card, uh, you can make those there. We, we uh, thank you for your, your, uh, your offerings and your tithes. Uh, we ask you to continue to do that. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We thank you, Father, for an opportunity to just return a bit of that to you at this time. Uh, we pray that you would use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry.
doxology. Praise God from seated yes Nick come on up uh, we're gonna have a speaker come on up uh, Bruce yeah yes work with the Gideons and have a Gideon speaker come for a little bit just to give us a little bit of an update about things that are going on or short testimony on keep a surprise to the work that they're doing so Bruce is here Bruce Blackburn here this morning with us and he's gonna share a little bit with us I've arranged that at the end of the service, if you want to uh, give some money to help support the Gideons, there's an offering plate on the back toward this exit where the bulletins were when you came in. You can drop the money in there. If you uh, are doing a check, actually, if you'll make it out to the church, uh, but put in the tagline for the Gideons, we can make sure to, to uh, get it through and write them one check instead of navigate a, a whole lot. So that, that'll be waiting for you. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you, and I appreciate uh, you all supporting us over the years and um, having us regularly be a part of your church service. And I thank Pastor Sean for uh, giving us a few moments here to share with you about the Gideons. And uh, I know he said a little bit, so I'm going to make sure because he's got a shepherd's hook over here to pull me in case I, I get a little bit too long-winded. Um, but... Uh, it, you guys have been so kind in the past. It was just a year before last that you even hosted our pastor's appreciation banquet for us when we were having trouble getting things scheduled through Greenbow. Um, I want to share with you, though, a, a fairly new testimony that is uh, that we've got, and it's a young lady by the name of Sabati Banerjee. And it uh, took me a little while to practice to say her name, to tell you the truth. But she grew up, born in India, a part of one of the highest castes that there is very well educated family, very religious family, and um, and she tells us that as she was growing up, that they had an appreciation for Jesus Christ. Kind of considered him though to be about not a whole lot different than some of the other Hindu gods that they recognized, honored. But she said, as far as Christians were concerned, she didn't really care too much for Christians. And uh, but anyway, as she's growing up, she's attending a local school, there happened to be, at one time, a Gideon had come to offer her a scripture. <clears throat> I've got my, my testimony of uh, Sabati here, a lovely young lady, if somebody would like to take a look at it. I, I thought maybe I could have, maybe we could have put this up so you could see it on the screen, but uh, I'd be happy to let you all see her because she now gives her testimony a lot. But anyway, she <clears throat> was offered a scripture very similar to this one um, that would have been in the Hindu language. And, but she turned it down. Well, as life would have it, she, she's growing up and she's continuing on. She had met a friend. Uh, There's actually a Catholic young lady that ha had had a uh, had a nice walk with the Lord, and she got curious more and more about Christianity. Later on, in school, in fact, she even asked her if she'd ever read the Bible. Well, Sabati says, "I lied and I told her I had." But what she had done is her mom had one of these kids picture books about the Bible something that maybe many of you had in your family so Sabati had actually looked at it a little bit and she said but it always kind of bothered her what she said that she used that as her uh, maybe excuse for reading the Bible or really not reading the Bible a Gideon came back to a different school that she had transferred to and this time she received a copy of God's word and as she thought I know this will fix my lie at least in her uh, spirit so she started reading it and as uh, God's Holy Spirit started to touch her life she got to the book of Romans and as she got to Romans she that passage about for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God started to touch her and as she continued to read the scripture she realized how far her Hindu religion and her family and everybody that followed those beliefs had moved away from what God had intended and it really impacted her that Jesus Christ loved her so much, she had a difficult time to fathom, so much that he died for her sins. 
As a result, Sabati accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we want to say thank you because you put that scripture, even the first one that she turned down, that she took the second one. And so we thank you for allowing us the privilege of doing that and, and providing these scriptures. You know, we, we pass them out all the time here locally. We, when we're doing them, we, have, we get testimonies from even here locally in Greenup County from where we um, pass them out around. Um, I know we have uh, doing it old-fashioned days where we pass out a lot of our youth testaments. Sometimes we're able to get through to the fifth grades. Many of you probably got one when you were in the fifth grade. I still have mine. But anyway, I just want to say thank you for your support of our ministry. I uh, would remind you that throughout the year, uh, and I know we have a, a Gideon Bible card display to where you can do in memory cards, uh, sympathy cards, thinking of you cards. Those are also available. I'm going to check it before we leave. But uh, again, and everything that you do give goes towards the purchase and distribution of God's word. Again, can't say thank you enough. Pastor? Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. I've known Bruce for a long time, and, and that gentleman right there has been very steadfast in, uh, in his work with the Gideons, and, and uh, I'm proud to call him a friend. Um, as we go to the Lord, uh, yes, absolutely. Any of us support Gideons? I just want to reiterate, when I worked at the school for all those years, <clears throat> You know, the, the kids were so proud to get those little Bibles. Those Bibles meant the world to them. They would just hold them, and they would show them to me throughout the day. They'd put them in their pocket. They took them to lunch with them. They took them out on the playground with them. Those might have been the only Bibles those kids ever saw in their whole lifetime. But those Bibles meant everything. So if you wonder, does that help locally? Yes. It absolutely does. And I thank God that we have the Gideons that are still allowed to come and share uh, Bibles with those kids. Mm, amen. amen. Anybody else? Okay, let's, let's go to the Lord. Let's, uh, as we do, let's uh, continue to remember those that, uh, in the church and in this community who are, are suffering from illnesses, uh, those who are fighting cancer those who've had uh, surgeries and afflictions that they're recovering from. We've had a number of folks in our congregation, John and E. Schroll come to mind, that are struggling with some things right now. Let's keep them in our prayers. Uh, there's a list in the church office of folks on the church's prayer list. We, the Sunday school classes, I think, uh, have those lists. We pray for those in the morning. Let's continue to keep those folks in our prayers. Prayers work. Mickey's, uh, Mickey and Diane are perfect examples of that. We know others. Uh, let's continue to always keep those folks in our prayers. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your very many blessings. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. And thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today, Father. We ask that you forgive us where we fall short. We thank you for those in our church and in this community who strive to, sh to spread your gospel. Thank you for Bruce and the work of the Gideons. We ask that you bless that effort. Father, we ask that you be with Pastor Sean as he brings our uh, sermon this morning, as he brings our lesson. We ask that you be with those uh, that lead our ministries in this church. We ask that you continue to inspire them and guide them and lead them. Father, we ask that you continue to bless this church. Help us, Lord, to be more of a presence in this community. We ask that you, you help each and every one of us to love others more than we do. We ask, Father, that you continue to strengthen us individually and collectively as Christians. Help us, Father, to be strong. Help us, Father, to be compassionate. Help us to love people that we don't like. Guide us and direct us as we go from this place today. Keep us all safe, Father. Help us, Lord, to do your will in all we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
throw out there for you again that uh, our practices right now we're looking at them actually doing music on the second and the fourth and so they practice on the Thursday before that generally so keep an eye on that and if you want to sing I didn't ask if you think you sing good I ask if you want to sing uh, come to practice I would love to have you there especially as we're building up some things headed in towards Holy Week and then of course Easter uh, there'll be specials that are coming up for that I uh, would also like to say as we get started that um, I, I thought Spencer's hair looked great um, before when it was long. I'm less jealous of this haircut, but uh, <laughs> I'm jealous of anybody that can change their hairstyle. Mine's pretty much set now. For the <laughs> Join with me in, uh, in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> now Aaron's son... Nadab and Abihu each took his censer, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered unholy fire before the Lord, such as he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, through those who are near me I will show myself holy, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron was silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphon, sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come forward and carry your kinsmen away from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. They came forward and carried them by their tunics out of the camp as Moses had ordered. And Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not dishevel your hair and do not tear your vestments, or you will die and wrath will strike all the congregation. But your kindred, the whole house of Israel, may mourn the burning that the Lord has sent. You shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, or you will die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is on you. And they did as Moses had ordered. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, Drink no wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons, when you enter the tent of meeting, that you may not die. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You are distinguished between the holy and and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Now this passage was from our Bible recap readings uh, recently as we were working through Leviticus. How many people are glad we're done with Leviticus? Yay! Uh, Let me tell you numbers. It has its moments, (laughs) right? But uh, keep in there, if, if, you've, if you've pushed through it, uh, through Leviticus, if you push through Numbers, you will have gotten between those two and Job, you will have gotten through three of the hardest books to actually read and, and move through. So uh, if you managed to do that so far, well done. If not, 
Start today, just get back on track. Don't worry about catching up with what you left before. Start with today's uh, readings and just uh, go at it anew. But this passage, when we read through it, uh, it, it brought up a lot of questions. A lot of people uh, had issues with the passage and how we're supposed to understand it. And so the, t- the title of today's sermon is, Why So Grumpy, God? And, and I don't mean that either as something that's disrespectful to God or that makes light of the difficulty that this story and other stories like it in Scripture bring to us in terms of how to comprehend. that There are times in Scripture where God strikes out quickly and harshly against people. And we need to acknowledge that. They're in there. In this case, it's Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. But there are others. We know the story of like Uzzah in the ark where he reaches out to touch the ark uh, because it's, it's on a, a cart and it's unstable and he's worried that it's going to fall and he reaches out and nobody was supposed to touch the ark and when he does... He's struck dead. Or we think about Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, early on in the life of the church, and they sell some property, and they go back to the apostles and to the other members of the church, and they said, hey, we sold this property, and here's the money we made for it, and we're giving it to you all to use wherever it's needed. And what they didn't tell them was that was just a little bit of the money that they made off of the whole property. But they wanted to be known as extremely generous and uh, as righteous people, and yet they were lying in the midst of this, and both of them are, are struck dead as well. Stories like these could lead us to believe that God could be mean and cruel or that somehow he's moody and untrustworthy. If he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, look out, right? They could lead us in that direction. And some have looked at stories like this and said that the God that the Old Testament seems to portray and the God that the New Testament seems to portray seems so different that surely they can't be the same. That's part of the reason why I included Ananias and Sapphira, because there are things in the New Testament that are just like what happened uh, with Aaron's sons that we read about today out of Leviticus. God is consistent in Scripture. In fact, uh, we're warned that there's a great and final judgment coming, right? Where everybody who's not walking with God, everybody who has not had their sins uh, purged by Christ's blood, everybody who is not trying to live in obedience to God and walk with him in relationship with him, there's a dividing line that's going to be drawn in all history. And those that have been walking with God will get to go stay with him forever. And those that have not, there's judgment, there's punishment that happens with that. There's separation from God, and that separation is even called the second death. So how do we understand these places in Scripture, and how do we understand a God that somehow is consistent in these things that we see, and that we know to be love, and to be grace, and to be mercy? Well, I think a few things that we need to look at. One is just the basic understanding of the gospel story, and that is we're told in Scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is... Death, right? The, the wages of all sin is death. We, we wreak that on ourselves by disobeying what God has set up for us. All who have sinned are under a death sentence. And God would be, justice, uh, would be justified in bringing judgment anytime he wanted to any of us who have sinned against him. But he's gracious. In fact, these immediate judgments we see, like with Aaron's sons, They're rarities in Scripture, right? It's not like that's how God acts all the time. No, the vast majority of the time, God, in the midst of us, in this world that we've uh, we've created now through our sin that's broken and messed up, and we are people that are often broken and messed up, and we hurt each other in the process of that, and there's wars, and there's all kinds of mistreatments that we have, and there's addictions, and there's broken families, and all of these things that are the result of sin, and God doesn't say, I'm just done with you. He could do it every day, couldn't he? But he doesn't. There's a graciousness of God and a patience and long-suffering of God that shows through. And times when he cracks the whip of punishment are really fairly rare. Some of them are pretty uh, dramatic, like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Where God puts up with a lot and finally decides that it's time for the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
In a little while, our Bible recap readings are going to take us into to Numbers and beyond and on through Joshua. And the people of God are going to enter into the promised land. And when they do that, they're to drive out all the people that are there. That, that seems like God is being uh, harsh and unrealistic and that uh, he's, he's not just. He's not compassionate. And yet, we read all the way back in the story of the covenant with his people. He tells Abraham, look, your descendants, my people, are going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But then I'm going to bring them back. And they're going to go and they're going to live in the land and conquer the enemies of the land that I gave them. That's the promised land that's there. And he said, but that's going to be 400 and some years from now. Why? Because the sin of the people of that land is not yet fulfilled. In other words, God didn't just wake up one morning and go, oh, that looks like a good patch of ground. Go push those people out. No, he's been working with those people. He's been trying to draw them to himself all this time. And they've been disobedient and they've been resistant. And he's decided that now is the time that judgment needs to come. He just happens to use his people instead of fire from heaven this time in order to do that. But he is consistent and just in the very fact of doing that. Because all sin gets a death sentence. All all of human existence can be looked at in regards to a sinful group of people that are broken that God consistently tries to reach out to and bring home. To heal from their brokenness to bring out from sin, to heal them of their guilt, to reconcile them in relationship with him. That's what God spends the vast majority of all his time doing. And he's gracious. It's only on occasion that he does judgment in the here and now, in the immediate. Second Peter puts it this way. In uh, chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, he says, But do not ignore this one fact. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about keeping his promise that he'll come back and set all things to right. He's not slow about keeping his promise as some think of slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You know, the very fact that that after Jesus came, and gave us the capacity to be healed of our sins and to walk in a new life with God. We've had 2,000 some odd years of a broken world doing broken things, of war and all kinds of uh, mistreatment that we do to each other and addictions and all these things. And God hasn't just decided to wrap the whole thing up and say, I'm done. (laughs) His testimony to God's grace and love. He's patiently waiting while we, the church, his hands and feet, go out and try to reach as many people as possible because he's not willing that any should perish. This leads us to a couple of other things to think of, and that is what, what's at stake here with this idea of sin and judgment and all this is God's present and future plans for us. God desires us for us to be able to live right now in relationship with him, close relationship Now and for all of eternity when there's a new heaven and a new earth. Both of these require perfection. And none of us is perfect. That's why we needed a Savior. That's why he sends Christ, right? But if we're ever going to live with God, we think about heaven. We think about the glories of being in a place with no more sorrow and no more tears and no more sin. And face to face with God. And God is the thing that lights the whole city up that we live in. And being able to speak to him as though face to face... None of those things are possible while sin is involved in our life. Many times in Scripture, we hear the words that if anybody looked on God and saw God face to face, they would die. Why? Because we're broken, sinful people. So if we're going to live with him for all eternity, sin has to be dealt with. And sin is a serious thing. If it has the capacity to keep us from relationship with God and eternity with God, and good relationships even with each other, then sin is a serious thing, and serious things have to be dealt with. It's also crucial when we think about the new heaven and the new earth, right? If we go in there as we are now, if we don't think sin's a big deal, and we go on living just the way that we are now, and we go into the new heaven and new earth, won't it just become broken earth (laughs) 2.0? 
Right? I mean, we take all of that stuff with us. If, if we take our, our jealousies and if we take our disobediences to God and we take our, our self-serving things and our self-centered attitudes and the way that we act and our bitterness and inability to reconcile relationships with others, if we take all that with us, it's, it's not going to be heaven, is it? <laughs> it's not going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's just going to be the same old thing. What keeps us from new heaven and new earth and experiencing that? The sins that we continue to involve in our lives and with each other. And so, sin is serious business. It corrupts all that it touches. Sin is serious business. It has the capacity to separate us forever from a God that loves us and from the life that God created us for to begin with. So God treats sin seriously. And he, like any good parent, cannot always be gracious and never bring judgment or punishment. Any of you that are parents or that had parents, you know that punishment and discipline exist to help people on a healthy path that allows them to live life to the full. Why, why do we uh, punish our kids? Why do we have rules and regulations and we expect them to live up to those rules and those expectations that we have? Because there's lessons they have to learn along the way that will make life work. If you raise up a child... It constantly breaks the rules and regulations, and there's no discipline about it. You never call them on the carpet for it. There's never any punishment. What happens to children like that? If I don't set rules and expectation for my kids that work is an important thing and that you need to be willing to give yourself to the work you do and do the best that you can, if I don't do that, or if I set those rules and I give them chores that they're supposed to do around the house, and they never do it, and I just don't make a big deal about it, oh, well, it doesn't matter, I don't really care, go ahead, do what you want, <laughs> then what do you get? You get a lazy, you get a lazy adult, <laughs> right? Because they never really learn through that. If I teach my kids that honesty is important, that they need to not lie, but they need to be honest with me and with other people, and whenever they lie, I just go, oh, well, don't worry about it. Everybody does it sometimes. It's not a big deal. Then what do you get? You get adults that are untrustworthy, <laughs> and none of us want that. Right? We want mature, capable, loving people of integrity. And so as adults, we do discipline and punishment. I once knew of a, uh, a boy that was arguing with his parents about something uh, the parents had forbidden him to do. And the parents said, you know what's going to happen if you do that anyway. And literally the boy said, yeah, nothing. Because you always say stuff and you yell and you make a big deal, but then when it happens, you don't do anything. And then he went out and did whatever he wanted to do, right? That's not the way that God's going to work with us. It's not the way that good parents should be, right? We're trying to shape good things into our children, and God is trying to shape good things into us. And so God is loving and gracious, but God is also just. And God is worried about transforming us into the people that we need to be. How many of y'all watched the Super Bowl? Anybody? We were watching the Super Bowl down here, and they had those commercials. You've seen them for a while that are the He Gets Us commercials, right, that have uh, people washing each other's feet. It might be different races, or it might be different economic strata, or it might be an addict, or something like that, and it has people uh, washing their feet, and then it says, He, speaking of Jesus, He gets us, right, because Jesus would do those kind of things. He would wash people's feet, and he would, he would love the least and the lost, right? And, and all that part of it's true, right? I'm like all on board with all of that. But it falls short of the full truth of the gospel, which is that God loves us just as we are where we are, but that's not how he created us to be. He created us for more than that. He created us for better than that. And so he tells us, this is what it means to follow me. This is who I'm calling you to be. And yeah, now you might be a complete mess and you might have all kind of trouble. And you know what? I love you anyway. But because I love you, I'm not going to let you stay there. I've got good plans for you to give you a life that's much better than what you've chosen. But you've got to follow my truth and my ways to get there, right? So because he gets us, he's not only just loving when we blow it, <laughs> but he also says that's not acceptable. And help, let me help you grow into the person that you need to be and that I created you. 
to be. In this story, and many of the others, there's also one last reason God chooses to publicly and immediately punish. That is, oftentimes, like this story with Nadab and Abihu, and like the story of Uzzah and the Ark, and Ananias and Sapphira, God needs to remind his people that they represent him. And when they fail to do so correctly, it defames him and leads others astray. Aaron was not just anybody. His sons were not just anybody. They were priests. They were mediators before God. They were called to represent the best of God to the people and the best of the people to God. They were the ones, they were the go-betweens. And so in that position, as Aaron's sons, it says offered un- un- unacceptable fire, they basically just said, you know, God gave us these, these set ways of doing things, but I think it'd be cool to do it this way. Let's just throw some fire in there and I'll go into his presence whenever I want. Here's my sensor and I'll... And God says, no, 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 it's not going to work that way, (laughs) right? Not just because they'd done something that was wrong and sinful, but because they were supposed to be his representatives, his mediators between the rest of the community to understand the very nature and character of God and to act on their behalf. And because of that, God takes that thing double seriously It's one of the reasons why Scripture recommends not many people to be preachers or teachers, (laughs) Uh, because you're going to be held to a higher standard for what you're called to do as a Christian. And so in this case, God looks down and he says, what's the message that they're sending out and teaching the people about me? What's the message that Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament are sending out when they lie about what they're doing? to make themselves look better so that everybody will think that they're so awesome and godly and Christ-like, and yet in the middle of it, they're lying. It's serious business. What does that say about God when it comes out? What does it say about the people of God and what it means to be a follower of Christ? And so on occasion, though God is primarily and absorbently gracious and loving, on occasion, he says, this is a time when I have to act now. And I have to do judgment now. And it's got to be sick. We see that in the second passage, which is out of Leviticus, still talking about Aaron and the message that's been given to him in Leviticus 22. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, direct Aaron and his sons to deal carefully with the sacred donations of the people of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so that they may not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Say to them, if anyone among all your offspring throughout your generations comes near the sacred donations which the people of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he is in a state of uncleanness, that person should be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. No one of Aaron's offspring who has a leprous disease or suffers a discharge may eat of the sacred donations until he is clean. Whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has had an emission of semen, and whoever touches any swarming thing by which he may be made unclean, or any human being by whom he may be made unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches any such shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat of the sacred donations unless he has washed his body in water. When the sun sets, he shall be clean, and afterwards he may eat of the sacred donations, for they are as if food. That which died or was torn by animals, he shall not eat, becoming unclean by it. I am the Lord. They shall keep my charge so that they may not incur guilt and die in the sanctuary for having profaned it. I am the Lord. I sanctify them. They to Abba and who were priests. They were consecrated to be mediators between God and the people. And they were God's representatives. So if they show no reverence or humility in in doing what God called them to do, why should anybody else? If they felt free to uh, disobey God and make up their own rules and do their own things, why shouldn't anybody else in the community? After all, these are our priests, these are our leaders, right? What did they teach people about the importance of the obedience of God? That it really wasn't all that important. What are we going to do if if we don't obey God's rules? What's what's God really going to do? The temptation is that we might get to a point where we might say like that little boy, nothing. God puts down a lot of rules and he grumbles a lot, but he doesn't really ever. And so on occasion, God says, no, that's not completely accurate. (laughs) It's only because of my great love for you that any of you are still standing. 
And on occasion, I dole out judgment to make sure that you remember. It, it is vastly important that you obey what I call you to. It is vastly important that you represent me rightly. And that boils down to you and I as Christians. Because uh, on this side of Jesus, we're told in Scripture that we as followers of Christ are the priesthood of all believers. We are all mediators between God and an unsaved, broken world. And the way that we portray God is serious business. The way that we portray the community of faith is serious business. Serious enough that I think one of our first prayers every morning when we wake up ought to be, don't let me do anything double dumb today, Lord, <laughs> on behalf of you. Because we all know that some people's worst problems they have with Christianity and with God is bad examples they've seen of Christianity and of what church is supposed to be. Right? That puts a high calling on us that we need to make sure that we take all that seriously and realize who it is that we represent and to do it to the best of the ability that he gives us as we walk with him and lean on him through each day. And then the, the best news of all to me is if I can get in that frame of mind, if I can weave all that together, and I read through a passage like this in Scripture where it seems like God is hasty and God is harsh and perhaps even unjust or uncompassionate, I, I put that with the whole of Scripture and I say, no. <laughs> no, this is, these are small incidences in the midst of a huge ocean of grace and love and mercy and patience and forgiveness that he offers every day. Have you needed God's grace and love sometime this week? Did he have a reason sometime this week or in this month to smack you on the head, <laughs> right? And, and yet, and yet for the most part, that's not what we get, is it? We get God's love and we get God's patience and he reminds us and he nudges us and say, you know what, that was a boneheaded thing to do. <laughs> you, you can do better. Stick closer to me, walk with me, you can do better. Right? But the majority of what we get from God is grace and love. We always just need to hold in the balance of that, that he's also serious about being a judge. And we need to live life in the tension of those two things. Not tag him as just one or the other, but live in the tension. Father God, we thank you for your great grace to us. In fact, there are times just with my own life, and uh, my hard-heartedness at times, and my selfishness, my own, my own arrogance, and there are plenty of times when, Lord, I've looked at, and, I, and I've thought, I, I don't know why you even put up with me anymore. <laughs> you, you could have been done with me a long time ago. And yet, for the most part, you hold back your hand again and again and again through countless years constantly trying to draw us closer to yourself where we can find the healing that we need, where we can be given new life in you and begin the process of being transformed into the image of your son. This whole thing about holiness and sanctification that we don't often talk about anymore. That we can be transformed by you from one glory to another into the image and likeness of your son in all that we do and all that we think in the heart with which we do it. So Lord, I pray that we celebrate your grace and your love and your patience. But we don't, in the process of doing that, begin to take things so for granted that we forget that you are also a righteous judge and you have to be. For the sake of us, for the sake of the new heaven and earth, the new uh, life that you have planned for us, that lasts for all eternity, for the sake of all of these plans that you've always had to be with us, live with us, and dwell closely with us. You have to take sin seriously. And that means judgment and discipline come with it. So Father, help us walk that line well. That we serve you with obedience and awe and reverence. And we celebrate your great love and patience and grace. And that that's the message we convey to a world that needs to hear both of those things. We pray in your son's holy name.
Thank you, Pastor. Join me as uh, let's stand and sing 438 Cleanse Me. Greg, that's why we love to sing the oldies but goodies. As a reminder, there will be a trustee meeting right after a church in the chapel. Join me in the, as we do uh, say the Lord's Prayer as our benediction. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Don't forget, there's a Gideon collection box back there for your donation as you leave. Thank you all. Have a great day and great week.